We move into a new chapter today, and this chapter is based on permutations, combinations, and probability. Today we're going to talk about the counting principle. And when we talk about counting sets, we need to talk about subsets. And what a subset is, is it's a part of a larger group of related things. So here is a set of numbers, 1, 2, and 3. And what I need to do is find all subsets of this set. Now, I can represent my subsets as single-term subsets, 1, 2, and 3 individually. Oops. I can represent them as two-term subsets, so the set of 1 and 3, 1 and 2, and 2 and 3, and three-term subsets which is the entire set itself. And then there's another subset that has to be represented, and it's represented in every subset of every set, and it's called the null set, where there's none of those terms in the set. And in general, for any numbered or number of items within a set, there are a total of 2 to the n subsets for that given set. So if I look here, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 subsets. And since I had n equals 3 for the number of terms, 2 to the third is equal to 8, and there we have it. Oftentimes when we talk about subsets and items within a set, we talk about using Venn diagrams. And what a Venn diagram is, is it's something that shows the different groups of subsets that you might have and how many people belong to each set as well as how many people have something in common within in those sets and that's where the overlap takes place and typically also this all happens within a larger window of the total number of things that could be happening so we have a situation where a travel agency surveys 500 customers and everybody within this giant rectangle should be a total of 500 people. And then of those 500 people, we find that 300 purchase an airplane ticket and 230 reserved a rental car. And it also tells us that 100 purchased a ticket and a rental car together. So we know that within this overlapped region, we have 100. Now it says that 300 purchase an airline ticket. And I show right now that 100 people are within the airline ticket cir circle. So what I have is 200 people left. I also notice that I have 300, or I'm sorry, 230 reserving a rental car. And I only have 100 within the rental car circle at this point. So 130 must be in strictly a rental car circle. That gives me the total of 230. Now the thing is, within this travel agency, 500 people were surveyed, but right now I only have 430 represented. Well, other people could have booked bus tickets, so on and so forth, or just rented a hotel room. So in that case, there are 70 people outside of this interest point that I have with rental cars and airline tickets. And they want to know how many people only purchase an airline ticket. Well, that would be within the airline ticket, but not grouped with the rental car. So you can see that 200 would answer that. Now, in terms of sets and subsets, here's some set notation, if you will. If A and B are finite sets, which means they have a set number of terms within them, and the number of all the items, A in union with B, this means a and B together, all the items, is equal to the number of A's plus the number within B, and we subtract out the intersected part. This little upside down N, that's called the intersection. If I know that there's no intersection, then all the elements of A and B can be found by just taking the total number of A's added to the total number of B's. And if we talk about 
forming the total number of people in the set where we have no elements in common, then we just add all the different numbered items of the specific elements to get my total number of elements in the set. When we talk about finding combinations, we talk about finding different possibilities of arrangements where order is not going to matter. And when we talk about an event, we talk about something that's actually happening. There are two types of events. One is a dependent event where events that affect one another occur. And an independent event where choices that are made don't affect one another. And we'll see that as we get it further into our problems. So we've got this guy, Joe, and he needs a suit and a tie. And the suit comes in either black, blue, and it's made in silk or wool. And the tie is either striped or solid. And we want to know how many different selections he can make, how many different ways he can wear this suit. Well, the way we do it, and you've probably done this in middle school, is we make a tree diagram. And what we do is we start with either the suit, the tie, or the type of material and list those out. So let's go with black and blue. Now, he's got a choice. If he wears a black suit, he can wear either wool or he can wear silk. And then from that, if he wears a black suit that's wool, he can wear two different ties. He can wear a solid tie or a striped tie. And if he wears a silk suit, he can wear a solid tie or a striped tie. Then when I talk about wearing a blue suit, he could wear a wool blue suit or a silk blue suit. And off that, wear a solid tie or a striped tie for each situation. So what I've got here is I've run out of all my options. And this option on this branch, we call it, would be a black suit, that's wool, with a solid tie, whereas this would be a black suit, wool, with a striped tie. So we have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total different ways he can select things. So that would be my solution. Turns out that we use what's called the fundamental counting principle for a problem like this. In other words, if a task consists of a sequence of choices where you have P of one choice, Q of another, R of another, so on and so forth, you can find the number of different ways to make this combined choice by taking the number of items in P, multiplying it by the number of items in Q, and multiplying it by the number of items in R. If we go back to our last example, we see that we had two choices for color. We had two choices for material. And we had two choices for the tie. And if we multiply those three together, we get eight. Let's do a couple more examples like this. We've got a guy who fishes. He's got five poles, four types of line, and 43 different lures. And you want to know how many different fishing setups he can make. Well, again, one item of choice is the poles he can use. And he has five of those. He's got the line choices. He's got four of those. And he's got 43 oops, the lure choices. He's got 43 of those, and I want to know how many different ways he can put together his fishing setup. I just multiply all those together, and that's going to get me 860 different setups. Now, if you toss a coin five times, you want to know how many different arrangements of heads and tails can be made. Well, again, we can do a tree diagram for this, and sometimes that's actually going to help. But all we really have to do is consider each toss a different set of choices. So on my first toss, I have 
two outcomes. On my second toss, I have another two outcomes. On my third toss, another two outcomes. Fourth toss, another two outcomes. And fifth toss, another two outcomes. So really what I have is two to the fifth different ways to do this or 32 different combinations of heads and tails depending on the number of times I toss the coin. If I want to find out how many different six space license plates can be made with three letters in the first space and three numbers in the second three spaces, then what that says is I have six different events happening. The first event is for the first space, and I can only choose between letters. So I have 26 different letters to choose from in that first spot. This problem doesn't mention anything about not being able to repeat letters, so I have 26 choices for my second spot and my third spot. When we start talking about choosing numbers for my three spaces at the end, Remember, you can only use sing single digit numbers. So we've got the numbers 0 through 9, which is 10 possible numbers here. And since they could repeat, I have 10 here and 10 here. So this is, whoops, I can't believe I just put 23 right here instead of 26. But which gives me 26 to the third power times 10 to the third power, which is a pretty big number. About 17 million. 576,000 different license plates. And you'll notice we've only got six letters here. California used to be a six, six number license plate and they went through over 17 million combinations, which is why we now have, I believe, seven digit license plates. We're not talking about vanity license plates, it's different. So that's all we've got for you today. Fill out your My Math Lab and do your summary, and we'll chat more tomorrow.